Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm so Hi. sorry for you today. <laughs> no problem. No problem. No, we were, yeah. Manuel and I were just having a good old chat, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, just catching up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining. Is it Yenke? Is it Dr. Uh, uh, Van de Mer Merle? Yeah, well, we're trying <laughs> to get that right. Which right. we pronounce I'm it totally properly. That, right? Sorry. Okay, so pronunciation is Ninka Van der Merle. Um, you don't have to call me doctor. I don't really care about that. So just call me Ninka. <laughs> I, I like to keep it informal. No problem. Okay. Yeah, so awesome. First of all, thank you so much for accepting when I sent you that email, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm assuming you're not from Canada. So how do you like Canada so far? You're at the University of Victoria. How, how do you like uh, Vancouver and BC? Uh, oh, I, I totally fell in love with Victoria. So I moved here three and a half years ago. And I think after yeah. a month, I was like, I never want to, <laughs> I want to leave, never want to leave yeah. here again. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I love That's... the nature and um, yeah, the climate here, the people, so. But okay. the congratulations are in order because I, I believe you secured a faculty position back home, right? So, yeah, yeah. So you yeah. are leaving. So you are leaving. <laughs> I am. I am leaving. But that is that is just the reality of, of yes. academia. Yeah. You can't always choose where you're gonna work. Yes. If there had sure. been if there had been a faculty opening here, I would have stayed here for sure. But yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's just how it yeah. works. Yeah. 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 And I mean, no, on the bright side, you're you're gonna be back home with family, right? Family and friends. Yeah, that that yeah. will be nice. And it's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've really enjoyed the last three and a half years living here and uh, yeah. going to enjoy mm -hmm. my final summer before I move back. So it's uh, yes, yeah. take advantage of that for sure. Um, so it's funny, I was talking to Emmanuel and, um, you know, we've had, you know, paleontologists here, we've had, you know, plant biologists, uh, ophthalmologists, and I think out of everybody, this is probably the most, uh, the subject that's the most outside of our comfort zone. So uh, <laughs> we're, we were really excited about this uh, this meeting. So it, it gives us a chance to, to learn. Um, and, you know, I just curious before we kind of get into your research and stuff, uh, when we were talking to Dr. Corin Sullivan, he was a paleontologist and he said, you know, I pretty much, uh, you know, never grew up as a kid because, you know, the stars and the planets and like dinosaurs is like something that we all uh, are so into as a kid. And he felt that he never grew up. That's why he kind of got into that. Is that <laughs> something that like, you can relate to or how did you get into this whole field um oh well that's, that's a very funny comparison because um there, there were many things that i liked as a kid and so astronomy was one of them and stars and planets but dinosaurs yeah. was actually another one right, um, right. but i also liked ancient egypt and rome and cats and tigers i don't know there were there were many things that i really liked as a kid so mm -hmm. astronomy was not like my childhood dream um, it was more that in in high school I uh, this, I realized that I really liked physics, uh, so I started to look into opportunities like what where can I study physics? What what kind of jobs can you get? And then I heard you could do like a double major physics and astronomy at some of the uni Dutch universities, and uh, that that sounded really exciting. And so so that's really how I got into it. It was more from the interest of physics than anything right. else. And, and when I got into research and started to go to telescopes and take observations, that that's really when I got fascinated by astronomy itself. Wow, and having looked cool. back since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which which parts of uh, astronomy and physics are you more interested in? I, I, you know, can you explain a little bit about the, your current uh, research uh, project that you're working on right now? Uh, right. So, well, my my overall research is about planet formation. Um, so, I I look at young stars that are still surrounded by circumstellar disks of gas and dust. So you can imagine those like pancakes with a tiny hole in the middle where the star is. Um, and so we, we know that the planets must form in these disks within the first sort of 10 million years of the lifetime of the star. Because after that, the disks don't exist anymore. Um, as soon as we look at older stars, there are no more disks present. So that's kind of how we estimate that time scale. Um, and so my research is about trying to figure out what are the conditions in those disks? What kind of signatures do we see that maybe planets are already forming or are already completely formed? For example, if a planet um, uh, is, is sitting at a certain radius, it will, it will orbit the star and clear its orbit. So it carves a gap um, and we can observe those gaps um, in, in either dust or molecular line gas emission. So we can study um, dust densities, gas densities, chemistry, radiation fields, 
um, all of these, these sort of physical uh, properties of the disk, uh, try to constrain them with observations and then feed them into, into our computer models where we try to create a planet. Uh, within the within the simulation, so it's um, the, the field itself is very interdisciplinary between uh, computer simulations and uh, observational data. Wow, very interesting! Cool. And you say oh. it takes ten million years to to form a planet, roughly? Is that what you say? We think so. But may, maybe maybe On average? One, maybe one million year. Um, so so, so okay. In astronomy, there's a running joke that everything is yeah. correct. Is, is estimated within an order of magnitude, <laughs> so within a factor of 10. Okay. And that's definitely true for this one too. In, in fact, we don't know how planets form. We have a bunch of models, but wow. the predictions that they have right now, they don't match with what we observe. So we're still fine tuning those models, still update, updating those models. And I think an, an important part there is that, um, that a, a lot of things have changed in the last 30 years, also with the discovery of exoplanets, because back in the days we only knew nine planets right only the planets in our solar system so everything that we knew about planet formation was kind of based on that this was like our example and then yeah when you only have such a small sample you start to think oh this is this is like the foundation this is how everything must look like every planetary system in the solar in the universe must look the same because we can explain it with our model uh with like the rocky planets in the inner part and the gas giants in the outer part and you know did it all kind of work together in a certain planet formation model mm -hmm. um but then when we started to discover that there were uh, exoplanets and more importantly that those exoplanets looked completely different from the planets in our solar system uh for example you have these hot jupiters so very jupiter massive jupiter-like planets that are located very close to the host star um and also super Earths, which are planets that don't exist in our solar system because they have a mass and radius kind of in between Earth and Neptune. Um, and, and we discovered that those kind of planets are actually pretty common. And maybe the solar system is more of an exception. So then you need to update all your planet oh, wow. formation models to reflect that. And that it, it basically, yeah. it, it puts everything upside down and you need to, you need to be constantly be, be critical of what you're reading in the literature of previous research, because we have new insights, that means that you may have to forget about ideas that have been around for for decades. So it's yeah, uh, I think, yeah. This is one of the really exciting things for me about about this research that you you always have to be able to take a step back and think, oh well, maybe you thought that for forty years, but maybe it's not true anymore because we have these new insights. Yeah, well, it's, it's very similar to like like uh, Pluto, right? I mean, I. I was I was brought up to say you know to consider Pluto as a planet, but now it's considered what a, a dwarf planet, which is not right. an official planet, right? So yeah. so things are changing. You know, all all the history books that I've read are are you know obsolete now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? yeah well, it's, it's it's updated, right? And it's not that yeah. Pluto doesn't exist anymore. It's just that there yeah. are a whole bunch of other dwarf planets out there, and it just became more complicated to add tw twenty additional planets to our solar system instead of just saying, well, maybe we should not call this a planet anymore. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so what is the so difference? Is yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, that's exactly what I was going to ask as well. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what is the difference between a dwarf planet, a, a quote unquote real planet, and an exoplanet? <laughs> um, OK, so, so first of all, an exoplanet is simply a planet around another star than our sun. So, OK. So planets in our solar Simple system, enough. we call planets. Yeah. And, okay. and outside, we call exoplanets. Um, but I, I, I probably use that term a little loosely when I talk about disks where planets are forming. I'm, I'm actually not saying that, I, I probably should say that exoplanets are forming there, but okay. Um, gotcha. And then for the difference between dwarf planet and real planet. So this is something that was basically decided by the International Astronomical Union. Um, what is it, like 15 years ago? that this, this was around the time that we discovered that there are all these other dwarf planets around Pluto. Um, then they, they basically said, well, let's, let's add this requirement that you can only call the planet if it has cleared its, its entire orbit of other similar like rocky objects. So the fact that there are so many dwarf planets sitting out there makes, it makes them less like real planets because they are not 
large, massive enough to have that effect on, on its surroundings. Cool. Okay. Okay, well, thanks for that explanation. Yeah, <laughs> I j just to give like a, a, our listeners kind of a scope. So I was doing a little research this morning and uh, you know, everyone's heard of the, the Milky Way galaxy. That's our galaxy, right? And mm -hmm. I correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it you know, according to the Google, it says that uh, the Milky Way has a hundred billion planets um, and is every, uh, and it has, so basically one of my questions was, so how many galaxies are there in, in the universe? Just to give a, an idea <laughs> of like um, the scope of. I, I think also like, well, I think like a hundred million. million. 100 million i don't know a large number <laughs> honestly really? i don't so so to study the so if you study planet formation you don't actually look at other galaxies because they're too far away you cannot zoom into individual stars okay um, to study planet formation outside the milky way or, or even yeah. on the other side of the milky way it's just too far away things become too okay. faint and okay. too small so um you could say i'm a little limited but i don't yeah so I, I think it's the estimates are about a hundred million galaxies uh, in the oh, universe. Crazy. So it's, it's, uh, it's a always lot. a factor of a hundred. Like, you're right. You're right. It's a factor of ten or a hundred, whatever yeah. number. Yeah. <laughs> that is being thrown out. And uh, but and, and apparently there's three hundred and three thousand two hundred solar systems in our galaxy. Um. Okay. I don't know what that number is based on. So. So okay. first of all, so we haven't detected a hundred billion exoplanets. Uh, let me let me start with clarifying that. Okay. Um, what we've done with the Kepler mission and and later with the like currently with the TESS mission is scanning a part of the sky, um, looking for exoplanets, and then there is then you can calculate the probability that you can detect an exoplanet to begin with. So you you kind of you need to correct for that. And then with that correction, and then with some statistical arguments, you can say, oh, so every star in the Milky Way must have at least one planet. That is, that is the, the current consensus. So that is what that 100 billion planets is based gotcha. on. Gotcha, okay. We, we, okay. we have uh, observations of, I think around 4,000, 4,500 exoplanets. And there, there are online databases, betas, databases where you can find them, you can find all the papers that describe the discovery, etc. Um, and then there are papers where they, they actually do this, this kind of statistical analysis saying, well, just because we haven't studied all the stars doesn't mean we cannot say that there are, that there are no planets. So uh, that's what, what that follows from. The, the 300,000 number, I, I haven't heard that. I'm assuming it's a similar kind of argument, kind of how many stars have multiple planets extrapolating that again to what we what what we have studied so far and mm -hmm. then extrapolate that to the whole Milky Way. Okay. Cool. So you, you study planet formation. What are the, the main ingredients uh, to form a planet? I, I know you, you're studying like space dust. You know, that sounds uh, super interesting on its own already, but yeah, what are what are the typical ingredients that you need to, to for a planet to form? Um yeah, gas and dust. That's it, eh? So, so what's it. so special about dust then? Like, how, how is dust formed? Like, like you know, maybe the dust in like Pat's uh, bedroom, you know, can that form a planet eventually with the right gas? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so there are there are some properties that dust particles have that that make them uh, more likely to clump together. Uh, that makes them really? different than gas. Um, also, um, the way that dust particles move through gas, so well, maybe let's take a step back. We, we have this circumstellar disk, right? Which is this pancake that is rotating. Um, so material is, uh, all the gas particles and dust particles are rotating, rotating around the star in the middle. There's also still material accreting onto the star because remember the star is still forming. Um, and at the same time, the star is radiating. So it is evaporating the upper layers of that disk um and then there there are probably even additional effects by magnetic fields that we don't really understand there there are a lot of processes happening with that entire disk um, um dynamically and um 
so so one of the things that we that we think that are happening is the clumping of dust particles so when they are moving around through all these different processes that i was mentioning they have a certain probability of colliding with another dust particle and then depending on their size there are different forces that uh, result in those two dust particles actually sticking together rather than colliding and going in opposite directions yeah. so again there's a certain probability that they may stick together and so if you repeat that process over and over again if you have multiple collisions you can grow to larger and larger sizes so this is essentially how we think that planet formation starts with that clumping together of tiny little dust particles and then at some point those dust rocks or well you can all then at some point they become like planetesimals or kuiper belt objects kind of the things that we see in our solar system as well when they're massive enough they will start to uh, have their own gravitational field uh, or at least their gravitational field starts to dominate over the gravitational fields from the star and that means that they start to accrete material faster and faster and and eventually when they when they are um uh, as large, like basically uh, larger than uh, Earth, more massive than Earth, they can even start to accrete gas and then form a gas giant like like Jupiter or Saturn. Wow, so, very cool. So it all goes in, in different steps. And mm -hmm. the tricky part is that we cannot really, well, first of all, we cannot follow the process because again, this takes millions of years according to our models. Um, and also we cannot observe most of the larger stages because what we can detect with our telescopes are like the full disks and then the gas and dust distribution within that disk but only the smallest dust grains as soon as you go to larger sizes um, this may sound a bit counterintuitive but they are actually emitting less light and and you can maybe imagine it that if you think of the surface area of a dust particle or dust grain if you have a hundred dust grains that are very tiny, they have a larger surface, like all around their volume, compared to sticking them all together, because then it's only that outer surface of that cloud of dust particles, right? So mm. if you grow larger, you essentially lose um, a lot of the light that they that it is emitting. So at some point they grow too large for us to detect, and then we just have to guess what's happening. Oh wow. I can't imagine that planets are simply formed from dust, you know. It, it makes me look at uh, the dust in uh, the corner of my room a little bit differently now. I want to start gathering it, <laughs> yeah. start gathering it. And then so, so the, so it does, the, it forms yeah. a dust ball. Yeah, right? that's basically Probably it. the same concept. <laughs> yeah, well, the good thing about the dust in your room, or in my room, um, is that the gravity of the Earth is a whole lot stronger than yeah. whatever forces they have on each other. So don't worry, they're not going to spontaneously form. <laughs> Unless we collect enough dust well, to make it big enough to form its own yeah. gravitational force. <laughs> well, good luck with that. <laughs> right. Wow. I wish you could, because it'd be cool. easier to vacuum, easier to clean up. <laughs> um, yeah. what, and so you're talking about observing um, these planets at uh, obviously very far distances. <laughs> How has the technology evolved? You know, I remember as a kid going to these you know, huge like dome, like telescopes looking into the, into space. And, you know, with technology, I think they're trying to like make things more and more, you know, smaller and more powerful. Has that changed that technology within the last, you know, 20, 25 years and, and Absolutely. on top, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, well, first of all, telescopes, we built larger and larger telescopes, um, okay. which means that you can collect more lights. So, and, uh, and a second th uh, thing of a larger telescope is that you can see smaller details. You have higher resolution. Um, and uh, yeah, so you, you may know this term from photography, higher resolution means you, have, you, you can see smaller details. You have a sharper image. Um, the problem is that these circumstellar disks are, they're not really emitting in optical light, visible light that we can see with our eyes. You have to go to infrared or even microwave radiation, what we call millimeter radiation. So these are literally millimeter wavelengths. Um, and so when you go to these longer wavelengths, it actually becomes uh, even more challenging to build large telescopes. And the reason is that, that the resolution, that was, uh, the, so the detail you can see, it, it's actually, that's a very simple relation. Like I don't, I, I, I normally don't show equations, but this is a very simple one. It is 
the resolution equals the wavelength that you're observing divided by the diameter of your telescope. So that means that if you are observing at one millimeter wavelength with a 30 meter diameter telescope, your resolution is still super crappy. Like you cannot see, make an image of your disk. In fact, your whole disk and probably the neighbor disks are all like one big blob. Yeah. So, um, but a 30 meter telescope is already pretty big. Like that's kind of the biggest that we have right now in, in radio um, or in, in millimeter, uh, sorry, in, in millimeter uh, telescopes. Um, so, what you, and then the next step, instead of building larger and larger, which is super expensive and also becomes impractical because it becomes really heavy, um, is you can make use of a technique called interferometry. And that means that you are, you uh, build an, a set of telescopes, an array of telescopes, and they are all connected with each other with underground cables. And they all look at the same object at the same time. And, um, you can imagine that the light from that object arrives slightly different at slightly different times at all these different telescopes, simply because it takes longer to get to get to them if they're at different locations. And you can use that time difference in order to get that higher resolution. And that, like, that's a very technical story. I won't get into that. But oh, wow. the interferometry okay. allows us basically to get to this very high resolution, essentially you get a resolution of the wavelength divided by the distance between your telescopes rather than the diameter. So if you have an, an, an array like, like ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, that is the, the observatory that I'm using the most, um, it consists of 66 telescopes and the longest distances they have is 16 kilometers. So wow. it's kind of the equivalent of a, of a telescope that has a 16 kilometer diameter. Crazy. Um, wow. Yeah. So, so where's that located right now? The, the Alma is that in BC? Uh, no, is BC is uh, not quite the best place for uh, observation like that because you need a very dry environment. At millimeter wavelengths, there is a lot of water in the atmosphere that is blocking all the light from, okay. from uh, yeah. the universe. So you need to go to a desert. Um, and Alma is actually in the name Atacama, large millimeter array, Atacama. Okay. is the name of a desert in the northern part oh. of Chile. Oh, really? Okay. So that's where I okay. So there are no large telescopes here in Canada then? Is that... Uh... Um, well, there are, but they observe uh, at even longer wavelengths. Um, oh, okay. So um, that is, yeah, we call that radio, classical yeah. radio. That is more like meter wavelengths. Yes. Um, and there are a number of telescopes and actually also an array. Um, that is located in Penticton in BC. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So the yeah, one in Chile. Checked, right? There are no desserts yeah. in Canada, Emmanuel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's my figure, right? There is, yeah. uh, there is nowhere to really have uh, this kind of telescope. So for the one in Chile, you don't have to fly there. Everything can be done digitally, like you want to view, or do you have to physically be there? No, but that is actually true for most telescopes these days, that you don't have to go there anymore. Um, so so the way the telescopes work, like yeah. if I want to observe with Alma, um, well, I'm not the only one. There are a lot of astronomers all over the yeah. world. They all, we all want to observe with Alma. Um, so once a year, there is a proposal uh, call where all astronomers can put in a, uh, an observing proposal where they say, this is the science I want to do. This is why it's important. This is what we're going to learn. And this is how much time I need. Okay. Um, and then all those proposals are evaluated. Um, and ranked and only like the top 10%, 20% of those, they get time. Wow. And as soon as you get the time, oh. um, yeah. you still don't have to go there. Uh, you actually just have to send them your exact observing script. So uh, the exact settings and like when to point there, when to point there, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Um, and then that script is placed in the, in the que observing queue of the telescope. Um, and then depending on your ranking, depending on the weather, depending on whether your sources are actually above the horizon, they will observe it sometime during the semester. When it's done, you get an email with a download link, you click on it and then you get your data. So you, wow. don't, you don't go there, yeah. you don't, yeah. um, and, and, and 
the advantage is, of course, well, other than not having to travel, is also that you, you have a higher guarantee that your data will be taken bec because uh, some telescopes, they still do um, what we call visitor mode, where they, they do allocate you time and they say, okay, you can go observing between March 20 and March 25. Um, you show up at a telescope. Oh, sorry, actually something broke yesterday. We don't know how long it's gonna take. Yeah, just just oh. just wait and hopefully we can fix it before you before the end of your, your run. Yeah. Or sorry guys, it's snowing. We can't go up to the telescope because the road is icy. Sorry, it's raining, rainy and windy. We cannot open the dome. There are mm -hmm. many things that just happen randomly. And if they they happen at the time that your observers observations were scheduled, it's essentially it's just your loss. And with this yeah. Q observer thing, you don't have that problem because everything stays in the queue and it will just be observed based on the ranking that it had. So there's there's huge yeah. advantages. Right, oh, right. Wow. So yeah. also probably on the back end too, like the, the data analysis and software has gone much better as well over the yeah. years. So yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty convenient. Yeah. Wow. So uh, for black holes, are they kind of like the opposite? Is that like the, the death of a planet or, or the planet that can make it or <laughs> well, yeah, what are those so we, about? <laughs> yeah, so we think that black holes are the, the, the result of um, uh, the death of a very massive star. So not all stars will become black holes, only the very massive ones. Um, okay. Our sun will not become a black hole. No, okay, because it's just not, not big enough, yeah. right? It, it has to do with the amount of mass that you have available, like as soon yeah. as it has burned up all the hydrogen, it will need, to, so at first it's gonna expand, becomes yeah. uh, a red giant, and then it, it, it's gonna shed its layers. Eventually it's gonna collapse back, and then depending on how much mass there is, it can collapse further and further. Um, so, and the mm -hmm. most massive things can collapse so far <laughs> to such high densities that you essentially have a black hole. Uh, right. So. Yeah, I saw right. in the media wow. just recently, in a, a couple of days ago, I think there was like new images of a magnetic field or something around a black hole, yeah. you know, uh, so yeah, yeah so there's, uh, there's is, a lot going on. Yeah, that is actually, um, <laughs> so there, there are kind of two types of yeah. black holes. There are the, the ones that I was just talking about the, from yeah. ma massive stars. But the one that you've seen in media that is is called a supermassive black hole. It's oh. the center of a galaxy. It is. It has a mass of like ten thousand stars or even hundred thousand stars. Um, we don't really know how they form. They may be the combination of many black holes that all attract each other and then become a supermassive black hole. But the the origin of those black holes is not really known. Wow. It it just it acts in the same way as. A single black hole, yeah. which we can understand just from from how a star works and how the yeah how its stellar evolution is is uh, can be computed. Yeah, right. Um, but the supermassive black hole is um, yeah, it's just a larger version of it, and we don't really have an origin story. That's what they're called black holes, uh, right? They're they're, un they're yeah. mostly unknown. <laughs> well, it's just something that is yeah. very massive. Yeah. And so massive that it, it not even light can escape and it has a yeah. gravitational field. So yeah. we can measure the influence of the of the gravity on its surroundings. And that, that tells us that the black hole is there. Yeah. Wow. So over yeah. the years, Yanka, uh, when you're observing these, these stars and these planets, the telescopes and doing data, have you noticed any any uh, indication of alien alien life form out there? <laughs> like, you know, you're observing this thing, it's like, what is this line going? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm, not, I'm not really allowed to talk about that, of course. But... <laughs> <laughs> you have to kill no. you, Pat. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. You're not, you're not broadcasting that. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, no, we've... <laughs> I, I can honestly say that I've never seen a signature of, of alien life. Um, it would be really hard to detect anyway with the kind of observations that I do. Um, okay. I guess the closest, the closest to it is um, so part of <coughs> part of my studies is is astrochemistry. So trying to understand the chemical composition in these disks, um, and in particular at the locations where planets are forming. If we can understand what kind of molecules are there, that will tell us okay that mo those molecules may end up on the planets, and mm -hmm. then that may lead to the beginning of life eventually. Right. So it's that's the so closest I, I can get. <laughs> <laughs> 
I can only imagine as you're looking outward, you must think to yourself, or maybe you don't, but just let me know, uh, like how, how amazing or how kind of like we hit the jackpot here on earth, like for everything to align, to, 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 make, to make life happen, you know? Um, yeah. Is that something you think about? Or? Well, not, not on a daily basis, but um, yeah, it, it, it does cross my mind sometimes. And this, well, this, this um, phenomenon that I was talking about in the beginning about the solar system being our one example for such a long time and therefore driving all science and planet formation theories until we realized, oh, there are actually all these other planets that are completely different. Maybe we're not that special after all. Maybe we're not a generic example after all. Maybe we are actually special. Like those kind of thoughts are, are interesting, yeah. So uh, I'm curious, so what is the purpose of, the, of a planet formation then? Like, I mean, for us, you know, we feel like, you know, a planet is to help sustain life, right? That's, you know, that's, that's one, one purpose. So not all planets can sustain life, at least in our definition, right? So what, what is the purpose of those other planets that are being formed then? Are they one day supposed to allow colonization of some sort of life, um, you know, or, or, you know, or, or do they serve some sort of higher purpose? I'm, I'm just gonna curious. No, so, so I don't think there's a purpose. I don't think there's a purpose to life. And I don't think there's a purpose um, to planets formation. Planets just form because physics works. Yeah. That's, okay. that's the shortest okay. answer I have. Yeah. Um, we don't know exactly because again, it's a complicated process. Yeah. A lot of different physical processes happening at the same time. So again, this is why I study it. Um, but it does happen and it happens everywhere. So it's not like planet formation itself must be easy because otherwise there wouldn't be planets everywhere. We yeah. wouldn't have a hundred billion planets in the Milky Way. Um, but, and yeah, I can, I think I can state that the fact that we have conditions here on earth that are suitable for life is a coincidence. Doesn't mean that there cannot be life elsewhere because there are still oh, many, many planets out there. Yeah. So it's yeah. more like you, the, the numbers are large enough that the same thing may have happened somewhere else. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it is rare, but not impossible. Mm. So, yeah, it just, it just makes you, yeah. it just makes you think, right? You know, like, like you said, there's so many billions of planets out there, you know, and it's, in other words, we just can't be the only ones, right? But it's just a matter right. of, you know, finding them or them finding yeah. us. Per se. Well, something good to keep in mind, though, is is um, time scales. Yes. Here, because well, the Earth is around, and basically our solar system is around four and a half billion years old, which is one third of the time of the universe. Like we think the universe is about fourteen billion years old. So that that's um, it's a pretty long time, and the universe is a little bit older. But yeah, it's a long time. Um, but if you think of how long life has been around on Earth. And more importantly, um, mammal life, or, or even walking around having legs or, or um, feathers kind of life. That's a very short amount of time. Like the dinosaurs oh, yeah. that's did that start 150 million years ago. Yeah. Um, so most of the lifetime of the earth, there was no life, or there was only very tiny bacterial life. Humans have been around even shorter. Like, Neanderthals were still walking around 100,000 years ago. The first humans, I think, estimated around 80,000. So 80,000 years divided by four and a half billion years. That's a very small fraction. Right. Um, dinosaurs have been around a whole lot longer than we have so far. We don't know how long we are going to be around. Like there, there are many things that kill species, yeah. whether it's animals or humans. So we don't know how significant we really are on the time scale of the lifetime of a planet mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's, there's planet formation are is there planet deaths occurring as well i mean, you mentioned like black hole is the death of a star but is, yeah. is there planets expiring or you know um well we're, 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 <laughs> yeah we're, we're not gonna survive <laughs> the death of our sun if that's what you mean <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so what's gonna, what happens at the end of a lifetime of a star is that it swells. So that means that it becomes like, it, it becomes much larger, um, which means that things become like, for example, earth is going to become much hotter when that happens. Um, 
eventually, uh, I think I think Mercury will actually be swallowed up by the sun. Like it will, the sun will reach Mercury's orbit. Um, then, um, when it cannot sustain that large size, it will, like I said, it will shed its outer layers. That is a pretty aggressive event. I don't want to say explosion, but it, it's probably going to swipe away all the inner planets. Um, we definitely won't survive that. And maybe the Earth itself will not survive that. Like it may not stick together as a, as a rocky thing. Um, right. So you could say that's the death of a planet. By, by itself, okay. a planet is not going to die. But it's just that what the star does is pretty destructive. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that clearly explains that. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I, we won't be, I, don't we won't worry, be it's going to be a while okay. before that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness, sorry, yeah, our well, plan's not going to explode anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there seems there's so, so much, so many unknowns and questions in your field, uh, Nienka. It's just, uh, it must be, you know, pretty exciting for you, you know, yeah. every day to just discover something new or think about, you know, uh, possibilities out there. So, you know, I mean, good luck to you and your research and, and uh, you going back home. Um, and, you know, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Yeah. You're welcome. Emmanuel, is there anything you want to bring up? Any? No, I was going to say, if, do you have any uh, social media accounts uh, you know, that we, you know, you would like us to promote, um, you know, especially you're recruiting, you're probably going to be recruiting new students uh, starting September. So, mm -hmm. you know, anything that uh, you would like us to kind of help advertise, uh, definitely let us know. Do you have any uh, like Twitter or uh, <laughs> LinkedIn? Um, I have Twitter. You can, you can yeah. use that. It's, uh, it's Ninka Merrill. Okay. Uh, I post there primarily for, fellow astronomers so it's it's not okay. it's not a public outreach account but it's okay. not so some post may be incomprehensible otherwise may be interesting yeah. for general public so yeah. you're welcome uh -huh. to tag me um, hey, those, those students that understand your posts those are the ones you want to recruit for right? sure for sure yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, have, I have to say i've already hired my student my PhD student oh, did you? wow that was fast but, but for future years hopefully yeah 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 that's yeah great, no, great. i was i was lucky so i i uh, i signed my my contract in the netherlands in in january Okay. And in February were the, the PC interviews, so I was immediately yeah. able to join that and, and well, that's fantastic. Right. And so that's, that's yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But of course, yeah. in the future, this this will be uh, this will be <laughs> I I will need more students, so that will be great. Yes. And uh, yeah, I do I do hope to, to attract some some Canadian students because I've yeah. I've really enjoyed working with the people here in Victoria. Yeah. And, uh, yeah I. That's mm. great. The, any the any uh, economy is very international. Yes, so, for sure. I will continue to work with people in Canada, with people in Chile, in Australia. It, yeah. Like no matter where I, where I live, that that's going to be possible. And that's uh, yeah. Also, in the past year, we've we've all learned even more how to work remotely. Yeah, um, absolutely. Some of us were doing that already because we were working with people in other places in the world. But now we even do it with the people that live in our own city. Um, so it's um, you could say it's a blessing and a curse that we already know how to do that. Um, and I, I do hope we can go back to normal pretty soon to actually interact with people in person. But it's, uh, um, let's say the, the internet and the existence of the internet has, has made the past year a whole lot easier for us. And um, again, it will continue to make re also working internationally um, will just uh, remain very, very attractive and very easy. Yeah. Yeah, the beauty of uh, the virtual network for sure. Yeah. 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 Are you speaking anywhere anytime soon, or is there anything you want to um, promote? Or? Well, so, yeah. Well, so something that I can promote is the uh, Nerd Nights. Uh, so uh, Nerd Night is a, a monthly event uh, with public science talk uh, talks in a in a pub setting. Uh, so usually speakers drink beer, audience drinks beer. It's very informal. Um, I, I started that in Victoria, but it exists in many other cities uh, in Canada and, and, and also US and, and Europe and other places in the world. Um, Nerd Night Victoria has been virtual for the last, I don't know, year, like on and off. We've been able to do some in-person events and then we had to go back to virtual. Um, so this may be something you could, you could advertise as well. We are called Ooh. Nerd Night YYJ after the airport. Um, so that's our hashtag, that's the hashtag on social media and that's uh that yeah that, that will be okay. great. it's of course not yeah. just economy it's all possible scientific fields yeah. but it's uh yeah. very cool oh, i never yeah. knew about that 
Is that like a website or is it a Facebook page or? All of it. Facebook, oh, okay. <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, website. Yeah. We'll definitely it's, look okay, it up awesome. for sure. Because you yeah. guys are in Toronto? Yes. Uh, there, yeah, I'm in Waterloo. A, so, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is a Nerd Night Toronto as well. So you may want to look that up. Um, oh, I yeah. don't know about Waterloo, maybe. Yeah. Well, Toronto's close enough, so <laughs> yeah. I could definitely uh, drive in for a beer. That's good, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's Indeed. awesome. Thank you so much, yeah. Nika, for your time. Really yeah. appreciate it. Um, Good luck with everything. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. You, All right. Nice to meet you. Okay. Thank you so Bye. much. Take care. Bye. -bye. See ya. Bye.